Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melissa Dalton, and I am the Public Outreach Coordinator for the Greene County Records Center and Archives. Um, today, I am doing a program for you called Preserving the Union, Greene County's Role in the Civil War. Um, but before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping notes. First, um, we are recording this program, so we ask that you please keep your audio and video functions disabled for the duration of the program. Um, we will have time at the end for any questions you may have, and we do ask that you use the chat feature for that. Um, and also, if you have any problems hearing me throughout the program, just let me know. Um, again, we can use that chat feature um, as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, as many of you know, April 12th marked the 160th anniversary of the start of the Civil War. So we wanted to take some time and share the role that Greene County played in the war, um, as well as tell, kind of tell you about the records we hold here that help tell th that story of the war, but also what kind of role Greene County played and what kind of role the citizens of Greene County played. So I just wanna kind of give you guys an idea of what, how we're gonna go through this. So I'm gonna kind of start with a background of the war itself and then kind of filter down to um, Greene County. So we're gonna start with the main events of the war, um, Green, Ohio and Greene County's role. And then we're gonna get into some of the individual records here at Greene County. So at the founding of our nation and the ratification of the US constitution, the question of states' rights versus the federal government was front and center. Um, this was really further demonstrated by the issue of slavery. Although many of our founding fathers, they recognized that slavery, slavery really did violate our, the ideals of liberty and freedom, they also um, wanted to maintain the idea of personal property rights and the, the idea of limited government. And when the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1787, the delegates from the North and South came to an agreement, and this was known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. And this compromise allowed for three-fifths of the slave population to be counted to determine taxation and representation in the House. So as a nation founded on freedom of oppression, slavery increasingly became a point of contention. Um, especially as the United States became the largest slaveholding country in the world. And when the federal government prohibited slavery in the territories, Southern states, which relied heavily, almost wholly on slave labor for their economy, felt that the federal government had no right to tell them what to do. So tensions between your pro and anti-slavery groups really came to a boiling point. And so these are what really led up to the Civil War. And so we can kind of see um, the differences in these groups. So in 1831, you had William Lloyd Garrison publishing his very progressive anti-slavery newspaper called The Liberator. Um, you had Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, published Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852, which was a scathing look at the treatment of slaves. But then on the other side, um, the Supreme Court upheld slavery with the Dred Scott case, um, which claiming a slave had no rights a white man was, quote, bound to respect, unquote. Uh, this was further seen with the execution of John Brown um, after the um, after an, a riot, an attempted riot, um, failed attempt to incite a riot at Harper's Ferry. So he was actually executed for treason against Virginia. However, it was really the election of Abraham Lincoln um, who actually ran on a platform of keeping slavery out from spreading. He didn't come out and say that he didn't, that he wanted to abolish slavery, but he just didn't want it to spread. Um, so he, the idea was to keep it from spreading to the territories in any new states. And that really kind of pushed things to the, to the edge. So 
So after his election, seven states of the South, those included South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. They seceded from and formed a new nation called the Confederate States of America, and they swore in Jefferson Davis as their president. Uh, Lincoln and most of the northern states, they refused to recognize the Confederate states and legitimacy of secession. Uh, the Confederate forces began to claim U.S. federal forts um, in their claimed territories, and this sparked even further conflict. Southern states believed that they would be backed by European countries because a lot of them depended on the cotton production of the South. But those hopes never really came to fruition because most of the European countries that did depend on it, they ended up having a surplus at that time. And then on top of that, they found out that there were other nations and other countries that actually had a, a superior cotton product. So places like Egypt. So they never really got that backing that they were expecting to get to. And so then on April 12, 1861, the Confederate forces fired on Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina, and this initiated the start of the Civil War. Within days, the federal government raised 75,000 volunteer troops. Um, four additional states refused to raise an army against their neighbors, um, and they joined the Confederate states. So this would have been Virginia, Tennessee, Arkansas, and North Carolina. Um, but you had four states, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and Mississippi, and all these states were actually slave states, but they didn't agree with the idea of secession, but they also didn't agree with the, um, the pressuring of the Southern states either. So they kind of became your border states, um, tried to kind of rename, remain neutral in some regards. Um, and we also saw West Virginia, this was during the time um, that we see West Virginia become its own state. They left, uh, they separated from Virginia in 1863 and joined the Union. So here we just kind of provide some uh, major events of the war, um, but obviously this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, so I just want to kind of go through a few of these. So September 17th, 1862, you have the Battle of Antietam, which uh, was near Sharpsburg, Maryland, and it was the bloodiest day of combat in American history. Um, January 1st, 1863, this is when Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which ended slavery in America and also allowed African Americans to join the Union Army. And then on July 1st through 3rd, 1863, was the Battle of Gettysburg. And this actually resulted in 51,000 casualties and it was the bloodiest battle of the war. However, it was a significant win for the Union Army and many believed it actually marked a turning point in the war. Um, after his success in the Western Theater and gaining control of the Mississippi River, Ulysses S. Grant was named the General in Chief of the Union Armies in March of 1864. And Grant put William Tecumseh Sherman in command of the Western armies. With the continual victories from the Union, Lincoln won re-election with more than 55% of the popular vote. Uh, Sherman moved his armies eastward, setting his sights on Atlanta and then the Atlantic. And this is actually what most people know as Sherman's March to the Sea. Uh, thousands of freed slaves actually followed uh, Sherman's army as they made their way to the coast. Um, and as after they took Savannah, they turned north and pressured the Confederate troops from the south. Um, and as the victory for the north seemed to be in grasp, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery and involuntary um, servitude. The Confederate armies were completely decimated by casualties and desertion by this time, and they had actually fled Charleston. Uh, the Union armies surrounded the Confederates in Virginia, and they lost their capital of Richmond. And although Lee had hoped to regroup, um, they were overtaken by Grant's army at um, Appomattox Courthouse, and he surrendered on 
April 9th, 1865, which was the unofficial end to the Civil War. Um, they, they actually did sign later, but this was the unofficial end. And then just several days after the surrender on April 14th, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater by John Wilkes Booth. So now we've gone over some of the major events of the war. I just kind of wanted to give you guys a little bit of background or a little bit of the statistics and facts about the wars as well. Um, so from 1861 to 1865, so just about four, four years almost to the day, um, there were 237 named battles that were fought um, between the Union and Confederate armies. And there were many more unnamed skirmishes. The war ended with the most American deaths of all the US wars combined, with more than 1 million total casualties and between 620,000 to upwards of 750,000 soldier deaths. Um, that's actually a, a newer number I saw. I also saw one that said maybe even up to 850,000 soldier deaths. So it was very close to a million deaths just in, for the soldiers. Uh, the war devastated the South and all the wealth that had accumulated within the last, with that last century um, through the use of slave, la slave labor was almost completely lost. Um, the reconstruction era was incredibly slow and the economy took generations to recover. And this actually ended up giving rise, um, gave rise to the Jim Crow era. And that was, Jim Crow eras were the, the laws that legitimized uh, or legalized the um, racial segregation in the South. So you may be wondering, what was, what was Greene County's actually, what was their role in the Civil War? Uh, during the war, Ohio sent more than 290,000 men to fight. Greene County sent more men to fight than any other county in Ohio. And Green County's not very big. Now at the time it was still, uh, actually by that time, you know, it was, had its current borders. So it was of, you know, considering what we know of today, it seems like that's a lot of people to be sent off to fight. Um, and Cedarville Township sent the most per capita um, in the county. So of the men that enlisted, a majority of them from Greene County joined the 74th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, which was organized in Xenia in October of 1861. Um, other regiments include the 94th and the 110th, with others joining um, the 154th and the 184th. There were others, but these are some of the main ones that we, that we see in our records. So you may be asking yourself, what records do we actually hold here at the archives? Um, and what kind of stories do they tell? So I kind of want to kind of take you through some of these. So we have records that speak to the movement of the regiments in and out of Ohio. Uh, uh, we have some records that speak to money and relief aid. We have, and what we'll actually end with are stories that we've learned because of records we found. Um, the stories of some soldiers and their life during and after the war. So we're gonna highlight some of these records today. So one of the first record I would like to talk about that we have that demonstrates troop movement is um, the field book of Washington Galloway. Galloway was the county surveyor for, from 18, from about the 1840s to the 1880s. And his field books in general can provide really great insight and in not only into the properties of Greene County, but also the events and happenings of the area. He was very, um, he, he was notorious for just making little notes about things that were going on. Um, and so in this field book in particular, this is um, field book number 10, and it's dated to 1862. So the first one is February and the second one is April. Um, but he speaks to the movement of the 74th Regiment 
from Xenia to Camp Chase, which Camp Chase was actually near Columbus, and then actually down to Nashville, Tennessee, their movement to Nashville, Tennessee. So at the time of these entries, the war had already been raging for almost a year. And at this time, there's really no end in sight. Um, so in the second entry, the one that says page 65, Galloway speaks to the sorrowfulness and the gloominess of the day. As many friends had, uh, many people had friends within the 74th, and they knew that not all of them were going to return. He states, many a sorrowful one, as almost everyone has some friends in the 74th who were going into active service in the land of Dixie. It is not expected that all of them will ever return to or see their homes again in Old Green County, Ohio. So you can see here that even he is well aware that um, this war is, is going to take many lives and that it's going to affect people close to him and within the county. So another record we have that highlights what was going on during the Civil War um, and how Greene County reacted are our commissioner's minutes. So in these particular entries, the commissioners discuss sending nurses and appropriating funds for the relief of sick and wounded soldiers, uh, sp specifically af right after the Battle of Pittsburgh. Uh, so these are actually from 18, I think these are actually from 1862 as well. So yes, um, April, 1862. So the first two, so the ones on, um, on your left here, they discuss the nurse aid and appropriating $200, which is approximately $5,260 today. Um, and this would have come out of the county fund. For, re for relief efforts. And so this kind of indicates that even a small farming community and county like such as Greene County, uh, the officials were very aware of the needs and role everyone was required to play to care for their people and to make sure that um, everyone was, was doing their part to make sure their, their soldiers were taken care of. And this is actually continued when you see the creation of volunteer relief funds. So the, these are monies um, that were committed to help the various families that were left. Um, so they're obviously the families of the soldiers. So these funds were distributed to the townships and then the township trustees would disperse the funds to those families they identified as being in need. So in these two instances we have here, um, the first one shows $736 and the second one, $1,465 was distributed to these townships listed. Um, today that's roughly $19,360 and $38,550 respectively. respectively. So that was a lot of money that they were making, giving to the families. And unfortunately, the, these two entries don't tell you the family names. We do have some entries that actually do list the names of the recipients, but most of them are more um, listing just the townships and how much went to each township. Another really interesting um, record from the minutes is a call to action from the governor at the time, David Todd. And it reads, the governor having this day by proclamation notified the people of the state of Ohio that the Southern border of the state was in danger of being invaded by the rebels and having called for men to aid in checking the rebels. The citizens this day made application for an appropriation from the county treasury of funds for furnishing ammunition for those that have volunteered for the emergency, it is therefore ordered by the commissioners that the sum of $200 be appropriated for the purpose of furnishing ammunition to those who have volunteered to defend our border, and that the county auditor is authorized to pay on the certificate of the military committee for such ammunition not to exceed $200. 
So this here is showing that the, um, the commissioners have received this proclamation from the governor and they are appropriating the funds uh, to those who have volunteered. So this specific call to action was for only men armed, only armed men to report. And most of those who were volunteered were armed with hunting rifles. And most of these hunting rifles were actually out of, was out of date weaponry. And most of them had little to no military training. So as such, most, these men were actually termed the squirrel hunters. So if you ever see thing um, from the civil war about squirrel hunters, that's, that's who they were. Um, in total, civilian men from 65 counties, numbering roughly 15,700, arrived in Cincinnati to answer this call to protect the border. And although these men were poorly equipped on several levels, uh, their sheer numbers actually prevented the rebels from being able to find a viable attack. And they actually retreated within just a couple of days. And here we actually have um, an article from the Xenia Sentinel from April 1865. So this is at the after the war um, of the governor discharge, a notice of discharge from the governor for the squirrel hunters of Greene County. So you may notice some family names here if, if you've got family who's been around in Greene County for a while. We have um, another record that I think a lot of people may not be aware of, which is actually soldier discharge records. Um, these records demonstrate the names of the men, their rank, um, who their captain was, the company, regiment, um, enlistment date, mustard out dates. So these are um, really, uh, really great records because they give you a lot of information about the soldiers. Um, so you can learn quite a bit. So for example, we have this one here um, for John Kearney, and he was actually born in Ireland. Uh, but he was living in Xenia. Uh, he was 31 years old, stood five feet, six inches high. He enlisted in Company D Regiment, or the 6th Regiment of the Wisconsin Volunteers as a private in July of 1861 and had a term of three years or the duration of the war. So he was discharged at Petersburg VA, or um, I'm sorry, I should say uh, Virginia in August, 1864. Um, but there's something of interest on his discharge. So let's take a closer look. So up at the top, it says, to all whom it may concern. And here, his captain actually made a note about the battles that he participated in. And the note states, John Kearney has participated in the battles of Gainesville, Bulls Run, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg. Thomas Kerr, Captain Company D, 6th Wisconsin Volunteers. So these, this is not a note you see very often in, in these records, but you do find it um, on occasion. So it kind of gives you a, a, another look into what the soldier went through, um, the battles he fought in, and probably what he experienced during the war, especially if this was, he was engaged in battle during a particularly bloody war or bloody battle such as Gettysburg. And we also have a Civil War letter, which is not something you would think that a county archives would have in their collection. Um, this was actually happened upon by accident. Um, it was found in the Wilson Pennewitt guardianship file. So at, at the age of 10, Wilson's father, Adam, he, he died and he left three minor children. So Mary, Wilson, and Hannah. And even though their mother was still alive, the three children had to have a guardian who would be responsible for administering any kind of financial assets. Um, of their father until the children reached the age of 21. So the file, like most guardianships, contains accounts and vouchers for each child showing how funds were spent. 
Um, so these vouchers document various expenses. It could be medical care, you know, sewing supplies, dry goods, travel, any kind of like needs that they, they had um, as children. And so they had to account for all of the, all, any kind of monies coming in and out. So among these vouchers was this letter and it's dated September 12th, 1864. And in the letter, Wilson Pennewitt, uh, who is a private in the Civil War, is asking for 15 or $20 to, to be sent to him. And so this letter actually served as a voucher for $15 that was ultimately sent to Wilson out of the account. So this is actually a transcript and it's written um, as, as he wrote it. Um, and I will read it to you. <laughs> so it says, it is with the greatest of pleasure that I grasp my pen in hand to inform you where and how I am. I went to the hospital on the 16th of June. I was at City Point near Petersburg, Virginia. I was down with my breast. I got up with my regiment on the second of the month. The last letter I got from you was at Alexandria. We were about three miles from Petersburg. They are still pecking away at it. I have no military news of importance to tell you. We have a pretty hard time here. We won't get more than half rations, but it's about five of us left from Greene County and Company C. Captain Kyle is a, gonna resign. I wrote you two letters while I was at City Point, one on the 15th and the other on the 20th. Mary, if John don't get you that money of Haynes, I want you to get 15 or 20 from Jonathan Davis and send it to me, for it is hard to do without here. I lost your and Hanner's likeness and my knapsack and $5 tobacco and the fight at Spottisburg or Spottisvania. We don't get half enough to eat here and I want you to send me yours and Hannah's likeness. You must let Hannah read this letter for I have no more paper and I had to beg for this. I would like to know what kind of time you had at camp meeting this year. I would like to be there and take dinner with you but I am so afraid I won't have the privilege very soon. We have had a dry summer here and we haven't seen no fences, no cornfields, no, nor wheat fields. The summer I saw William Byrne at the Battle of, of the Wilderness. I would like to be at Spring Valley this evening if I ever get home. The army may go for me. I and the army is played out with one another well. I must bring my letter to a close. These few lines leave me in good health. Hoping you, hoping when they come to hand, they may find you the same. I give my love to all inquiring friends. So no more till next time, your brother as ever, Wilson Pinnewitt. I kind of really enjoy this letter because he talks a lot about what, what they're experiencing as, as soldiers. They're not getting enough to eat. He's, you know, been moving from battle to battle. There's only five people left in his company, actually from Greene County. So it kind of really gives you a good idea of what he's been going through and, and even says at the very end how much he misses being at home and being with his family. And also along with Wilson's, uh, not just his letter, but we also have his discharge record as well. Um, and so this can kind of give us a little more detail about him. And because of this, we learned, we learned a little bit more about him. Um, well, for one, they spelled his name as Pennyweight, not Pennywit. Um, and so we have, we have that little bit of indication. So that could be something that we look for in other records, how it's spelled. And this record indicates that he enlisted in the 60th Regiment of the Ohio Infantry um, Volunteers and was discharged on July 8, 1865. However, his service actually started before that. He originally enlisted with Company D of the 74th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, like many um, in Greene County, like we just stated earlier. And um, he was discharged on a surgeon's certificate on October 5th, 1862. But that's when he or then he re-enlisted with Company C. Um, of the 60th Regiment in March 1864, and then was discharged on the date previously listed as July of 1865. 
So because of his discharge record, we were able to go back and take a look and see um, what else he had done within the war. So because we were curious um, about why he, you know, a little bit more about his um, service. So while he was with the 74th, he likely did participate in the siege of Nashville, um, which may have resulted in an injury that caused his medical discharge. So according to the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers, which is in Dayton, um, he had a knee injury, which led to his discharge. So when he re-enlisted with the 60th, we know from that letter that we just shared that he fought in the Battle of the Wilderness and Spotsylvania, and he was likely present for the Appomattox campaign, uh, which obviously resulted in the surrender of Lee and ultimately the end of the war. So we also learned by digging a little bit deeper into Penowitz's life that in December of 1884, at the age of 42, um, Wilson Pen Penowit was actually admitted to the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers in Dayton. Um, and then in 1887, he actually died of tuberculosis. So because of a letter we found tucked away in a probate file as proof of payment, we were able to learn the story of this Civil War soldier who suffered through rations of war, um, lost invaluable personal items, and, and witnessed great many battles. Yet he was able to see and lived through to the end of the war. Another really interesting um, record that we hold that's strange and interesting, um, we found that was, it was found while indexing Civil War pension records, which is another record we have. Um, and our archivist noticed that there were two entries within a couple of days, um, or within a couple of pages of each other for apparently the same person. But there were some definite discrepancies. Um, the man's name uh, was Humphrey Taylor. And he served as part of Company D of the 12th United States Colored Heavy Artillery Unit. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at these two pension records. So we have two Humphrey Taylors here with the same pension number claim, but they're, and they're from the same company and regiment. And these are actually dated just a couple of days of each other. So the first one, the first record is for a Humphrey Taylor, and he is five feet, seven inches tall, weighs 150 pounds, and is 41 years old. And his disabilities are listed as chronic diarrhea and total blindness. In the second record, this Humphrey Taylor is listed as being five feet, three inches tall, weighing 124 pounds, and being 77 years old. His disabilities are listed as a stroke and persistent vertigo or spells of vertigo and impaired hearing. So we definitely have some discrepancies here. These are not the same people. So who is the real Humphrey Taylor? And you will might also notice that the pension amount is different for each one based on uh, what their disabilities are listed. So that's kind of interesting too. So after some investigating, we learned that the real Humphrey Taylor was the first one for the, the man listed as 41 years old who was totally blind. Um, so Taylor was an African-American from Kentucky who likely was a slave prior to enlisting in the Union Army in 1864. Because as we learned, you know, after the Emancipation Proclamation um, that allowed African-Americans to to register um, and sign up for, to join the army. And after the war, he and Amanda Chandler married on October 27, 1869. And this is actually their marriage record here in Greene County. And the couple had two children, um, James and Paul, but unfortunately both died um, in childhood. 
1885, Taylor was appointed a guardian as he was unable to care for his affairs. And that guardianship ended about three years later after his guardian stated that he was, Taylor was actually of sound mind and able to care for himself again. So you may be wondering about that second Taylor. Um, from what we can gather, no pension was ever paid out to him. So we're not exactly sure um, if there was a mistake and somebody was something was written down wrong or someone tried to claim they were him. Um, but we found that to be kind of interesting. But Humphrey Taylor actually has a connection to a well-known man in Greene County, Willing Gaunt. Um, for those who may be unfamiliar with Gaunt, he was born into slavery in 1815 in Kentucky. Uh, eight, in 1845, he purchased his and his family's freedom, and they came to Yellow Springs sometime after 1860. And deed records indicate that he actually ended up owning quite a bit of real estate in Yellow Springs. And he was very frugal with his money and was bought and sold a lot of property. And he actually became very wealthy um, in this endeavor. And as part of his estate, he willed property to Wilberforce University, the AME Church, and nine acres um, to the village of Yellow Springs. And this last bequeath is actually one that is probably the most well-known as it included a stipulation that proceeds from the rent would be used to purchase flour for the widows of the village and um, regardless of their ethnicity. And this tradition became known as the Christmas flower. And that actually still continues today. So this was um, a really interesting connection to this man. So what is that connection actually? So Louisa Chandler, Amanda Taylor's mother, was actually the sister of Willing Gaunt, um, making Amanda his niece. And they obviously had a fairly close relationship as in 1890, Wheeling and Elizabeth Gaunt and his sister, Louisa, they both they all deeded property to Humphrey and Amanda with a note that actually read um, in the deed, in consideration of $1 in natural love and affection, which they have for the grantees. So this is kind of an interesting connection to one of probably the wealthiest and well-known men in, in Yellow Springs, uh, Mr. Taylor had with, with him and his wife. Um, but sadly, after losing two children, Amanda was committed to the infirmary for lunacy in 1891. And then a year later, she died of consumption. Um, about seven months after her death, Humphrey Taylor remarried, um, and he married a woman named Celia Smith in 1892. On August 3rd, 1894, Humphrey Taylor died of dropsy at the age of 46, roughly 46. It, um, the obituary says 50, um, so probably sometime, somewhere between 46 and 50. Um, his obituary from that same day lists him as a well-known man in Xenia and had, quote, seen a great deal of service during the war, end quote. Uh, the article claims that he had been blind for many years, um, but got, well round, uh, got around well with a cane and was known for his familiar whistle. Uh, his wife, Celia, died just over a month later of dropsy at the age of 37. You know, this is another one of those stories that we kind of gleamed out of the records that we just happened upon and were able to learn a great deal about another Civil War veteran um, because we were working on the Civil War pension records. Uh, so another really interesting story. Lastly, I would like to promote our virtual exhibit as well, um, titled Green County Soldiers Helped Save the Union, uh, which was put together by my coworker, Elise. And this exhibit actually um, speaks to the soldiers, Green County soldiers, and so provides you background about the, the actual, some of the men, um, the battles they fought, um, you know, what kind of role they played in, in saving the union. Um, 
it's a great exhibit. It's very informative, and I highly recommend that you check it out. It is on our Flickr page, and if you are interested in a link, just let me know, and I will be able to send one to you. Um, but that will tell you a little bit more about the individual soldiers and um, you know what what battles they might have fought in and that sort of thing. So I highly recommend that you check it out if you have time. So that concludes our program today. I hope you enjoyed learning just a little bit about the Civil War. Definitely was very brief history on the war itself, but also just some of the connections here to Greene County. Uh, if you would like to learn any of the other stories that we um, that I talked about today, we have featured many of them in um, previous blog posts. So uh, you could probably do a search and find them. Um, and if you don't already, please feel free to follow us on social media. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to uh, send them in the chat. I'll give everybody a few minutes if you would if you're interested in doing that. If you are looking, if you want to um, take a look at the exhibit on Flickr, um, I can actually post a link um, to the page on in the event page for Facebook. Does that make sense for this event? I can post it there, um, and I'll I can also post it just on our Facebook page again. Or if you would like, if you want to give me. Um, you want to email me, I can also email you a link. Um, I'm not sure I have it on this computer. I would just copy the link in here. <laughs> I'm not on my own per personal computer, so.